everyone. This is Heidi Kurtz with NAISCO. Thank you for joining us today. We have a big turnout, so we're happy about that. Um, I'm going to get us started before we have our two presenters. So first of all, welcome to the first of a two-part webinar series. This is Return to Work, How Indoor Air Quality and Energy Savings Fit in the New Normal. Part two is next Monday, the 29th, and we'll cover UV lighting and water technologies. And if you're interested in that, uh, there's registration information on our website under events. I would like to thank LFE Protect, which is a product of LFE, LFE Solutions. And they have sponsored today's webinar. So thank you very much, LFE. Um, I will be recording this session, and links to the recording and presentation to all will be sent to all registrants this week, later this week, probably Wednesday or Thursday. And there is one CEU available. Um, I have put my colleague Nina Kogan's information on the last slide of this presentation. If you need a CEU credit, please email N-I-N-A dot K-O-G-A-N at NASCO.org. And we will do Q&A at the end. So just if you have questions, submit them through the feature on GoToWebinar. Okay, we have two great speakers today. The first is April Frakes, who is AeroSeal's Director of Commercial Accounts. She has more than 10 years experience in national account management and a proven record of success in helping her customers effectively meet their goals. During her tenure at AeroSeal, she has presented at several webinars and trade shows, including the World Energy Congress, West Coast Energy, and GlobalCon. April has a bachelor's degree from Indiana Wesleyan University. Our second speaker is Tracy Stoner. Tracy is the Chief Operating Officer of Sustainability Management Partners. Tracy brings more than 30 years of experience in energy efficiency, engineering design, and program implementation, developing and driving strategies to achieve company and client objectives. Tracy holds a BS in electrical engineering from Clemson University. She is a professional engineer, a certified energy manager, and a licensed residential and commercial mechanical contractor in North Carolina. So without further ado, I'll get us kicked off by saying, April, take take the wheel. All right, thank you, Heidi. Having to, okay, here we go. So today we're going to talk about returning to work and how you can have indoor air quality improvement and energy savings both in um, what they're now calling the new normal. So we're getting a lot of guidance from a lot of different agencies in what we should do when we reopen buildings. Um, the first thing I'm going to talk about uh, is from Harvard University's um, Healthy Buildings Program. And they basically say that there's nine factors that in influence a healthy building, the foundations of a healthy building. On top of this, um, they basically came up with five, um, what they call a layered defense for, for a workplace uh, reopening. And the first thing that they said that should happen when people start going back to work is basically hazard elimination. So keeping employees at home um, as often as you can, which they, they note won't lead to economic recovery. Um, the second thing that they talk about is personnel substitution. So basically only bringing employees back that have to be in the building which obviously isn't going to work for a lot of your customers or a lot of the occupants in the building that, that you guys work on every day either. The third thing is what I'm going to focus on most today, and that's engineering control. So Harvard is telling us that we should increase the flow of outside air 
um, swap out existing filters for one that captures smaller, smaller particles, and um, even using air purifiers. The fourth thing they talk about is uh, administrative considerations, so staggering shifts and only bringing people in at different times. And then the fifth thing is using PPE, which is a lot of what we see now in buildings that are already opening, so face coverings, um, masks, those sorts of things. So let's talk a little bit about what we can do in the buildings and the ventilation to help um, when buildings are reopening and what that means as far as energy impacts from those items. So ASTRA's guidance is pretty similar to what Harvard is saying. Um, there's, they tell us that changes can reduce uh, airborne exposure and that you should definitely main, maintain and, and run equipment prior to bringing everybody at, back to limit the spread of COVID. Um, they're saying that you should flush the HVAC system before occupancy and operate the exhaust fans. They're telling you to run the garage exhaust two hours before occupancy. And then even when the building is unoccupied, they want you to keep those outside air dampers open and run the systems on minimum outside air. So I know what you guys are thinking, that all sounds great in theory, but that's basically all these energy programs that we've been working on for years have been doing the opposite of that, right? We're, we're trying to keep buildings as energy efficient as we can when buildings are unoccupied, but ASHRAE is saying we, we need to keep that ventilation going in the building even when occupants aren't there. Now the CDC has guidance as well. Um, they're saying that you need to run the HVAC units longer, you need to increase outdoor air ventilation, um, and you need to open the dampers as well to reduce or, or eliminate recirculation. So they don't want any of that bad air coming um, back into the building. So for me and, and my what I work on every day is what duct work means for that indoor air quality and all of that guidance that we've been given. And basically um, what I focus on is the ventilation of the building. So what we've known for years um, is that good ventilation helps in buildings for a lot of reasons. Uh, basically it reduces this building syndrome, which is what they, they call buildings that you know you walk into them you know you you know which buildings i'm talking about they smell musty um there's a lot of stale air a lot of odors traveling from one area to another um, but if you have good ventilation it reduces those symptoms it cuts absenteeism and of course the thing that everybody's worried about right now is that it reduces infectious disease transmission so let's talk about why it's important to have sealed ductwork when we're trying to improve our ventilation and increase all of this. And then also how that helps save on energy as well. So this is a, a, just an air handling unit system. And the blue is the fresh air coming in and the red is the recirculated air. So what's important in this diagram is when the ducts are all sealed up, you bring in a lot of fresh air, which is what the guidance is right now. And that fresh air is actually making it into the space. So all the fresh air that's going into the air handling system and it's getting combined with the recirculated air is making it into the room. And why that's so important is that you're actually diluting all of that contaminated room air, which we, I've been on lots of calls and, and webinars from different groups. There was one at the UC Davis lab a, a few weeks ago when they were talking about how important it was to reduce CO2 in the rooms and, and if you can't bring in enough outside air, how you need to even open the windows. But the whole time I was thinking, well, if your ducts aren't sealed properly, which is what I show in this document, then you're going to have a, a lot of problems just meeting what you're supposed to do by design, let alone what's going to happen when you're trying to increase that amount of fresh air that's coming in. 
So this is the same diagram, but this shows us what happens when you have leaky ducts. So basically, all of that fresh air that you're trying to get into the room is leaking out along with some of that contaminated air, and it's not making it into the space. So that dilution that you're trying to have happen in the room isn't happening because you're not getting what was even designed to begin with, let alone the increased ventilation requirements that they're suggesting now with COVID. So let's talk about what happens in an exhaust system. So in an exhaust system, when your ducts are sealed up, all the, the COVID polluted, like in the, in the toilet exhaust, things like that, all of that air gets sucked up and through the exhaust fan and goes straight out, which is what we want to happen. All of that bad air gets pulled out of the building. So what happens when you have a leaky exhaust? It's not pulling as much. You think about when you have a straw, right? And it has holes in it, and you're trying to suck from the top of a straw, you're not gonna be able to pull out the air or anything from the bottom um, of the straw, right? Your exhaust system is the same way. So your exhaust fan is working harder and harder to, to pull up that exhausted air from the toilet exhaust, but with those holes in it, it's never going to pull out that COVID polluted or any kind of polluted uh, toilet air. So let's talk about the implications of supply duct leakage. So the fresh air to the return or the exhaust um, is short circuited. So that means that it's sent back to the supply fan or the exhausted from the building. And the air exhausted um, depends on the need for the pressurization or the depressurization. So up to 40% of the supply air leaked never makes it to that space. So that means that all of that air that you're trying to get to the space is never going to make it there because of duct leakage. What that short circuiting also causes to happen is that causes an increase in fan energy. This means that your fan is constantly working harder and it's also bringing in more outside air to try to meet those demands of the space. But if you seal up the ductwork, you're not only going to be able to increase the indoor air quality of the building, but you're able to solve a lot of those energy reductions happen because uh, you're gonna stop that short circling, circuiting. So what it says at the bottom is the duct leakage reduces the concentration of COVID in the exhaust air, which is exactly what I showed you before. So how do we, Stop this from happening. You know, you think about a building and where the ducts are at, those are in spaces that we can't get to, right? They're behind walls, they're above ceilings, and there's no way we can go in with the mask and the tape and without demoing areas out and actually get to it. So that's where AeroSteel comes in. We were developed about 25 years ago at the Lawrence Berkeley Mass Laboratory with funding from the Department of Energy. Um, and the reason why we were developed and, and the most important thing that AeroSeal does is that we save energy. There's about a $2.9 billion per year energy loss due to duct leakage. Um, as you go through all these recommendations that's happening from the CDC and Harvard, and ASHRAE to reopen these buildings, that energy loss will just keep increasing um, when duct leakage is there because you're going to be trying to meet even more high outside air requirements. Um, so AeroSeal seals up ducts from the inside out. Uh, we actually pressurize the ductwork and send in an aerosol seal and seals up all the holes and gaps that you normally wouldn't be able to see or get to through manual sealing. Um, we monitor that the entire time we're sealing, and so we'll tell you how much leakage is there when we start and how much leakage is there after we're done. So you can show your customer and your client exactly what we've done, and you can reset um, all of the 
the building um, set points to work as designed. Um, our payback is usually two to seven years. As all of you on the phone know, uh, that varies depending on where you are in the country, uh, what kind of energy costs, that sort of thing. Um, but Aerosteel is, is very cost effective. Um, and like I said, with the results that we show, every time we seal up a set of ducts, uh, we're verifiable and guaranteed. Um, history tells us that 75% of ducts leak 10 to 25%. This is something that's widespread in every area of the country. And uh, Aeroseal has won a lot of awards and certifications. These are just a few. Um, at the AHR Expo just a few years ago, we won product of the year. Uh, the Department of Energy called us one of the most beneficial technologies uh, and back in 2002. We have all the safety certifications and uh, we're FEMS certified. And so this is an example of some of the places where AeroSeal has been installed. Uh, we do lots of federal projects, Bureau of Prisons, uh, Fort Drum, VA hospitals, those sort of things. Lots of colleges and universities, K through 12. Um, you know, we do even do clean rooms, uh, which holds a really high standard for safety. Uh, if you can get a clean room pharmaceutical facility to allow you in their ductwork, then you know that you're a safe product. And um, we, we do that all the time. So that's just a few things about AeroSeal. Um, I am going to turn it over now to Tracy. She has uh, quite a bit of information to provide to you. And then after Tracy is done, we will have Q&A for both of our products. Thank you so much, April. I think I have access, let's see. I wanna thank uh, Heidi and the NAESCO team for extending an invite to us today. Over the next few minutes, we're gonna discuss whether good indoor air quality has to equal increased operating costs. And we're gonna do this through the lens of bipolar ionization. Our goal is to share how needlepoint bipolar ionization can be used to accomplish clean air and energy efficiency. I'm going to briefly explain who we are, what ionization is, why it's important, how it works, and where it's been applied. We are sustainability management partners, and our mission is to provide indoor air quality solutions that lead to healthy occupants increase productivity and clean, fresh, healthy environments. Um, Heidi mentioned earlier, I'm the C COO of the company and I joined Darlene, our founder and CEO earlier this year. Some of you have actually worked with Darlene. So what is ionization? It's the artificial creation of ions that normally exist in nature. They can be positively or negatively charged. They exist in high concentrations where the ocean meets the shore. The ions are generated from the friction force of waves crashing onto the shore. They exist and are generated from the friction force of lightning and at very high elevations. These ions clean the air as only Mother Nature can. That's their purpose. Einstein discovered in the early 1920s that at high altitudes, the number of active positive and negative ions in the air is much greater than anywhere else. If we were to take an ion meter to the top of this mountain and take a reading, we would get somewhere around 5,000 ions per cubic centimeter. As we get down into our cities, those numbers get lower. And that's not surprising because pollution, 
processes, even people deplete that ion density. And what we find is on average, the readings are about 200 ions per cubic centimeter. And we've even found buildings where that reading is far lower. So the first few slides, we've talked at a real high level about ionization. And surprisingly, there are lots of ways to create ions. Uh, the equipment that creates artificial ions varies by manufacturer and technology. Even bipolar ionization is a broad term. You may have heard of corona discharge, dielectric barrier, and needlepoint bipolar ionization. So that's what we're going to focus is on the needlepoint. Let's break it down. Why is the word needlepoint used? It's real simple. We apply a high voltage electric charge to an electrode or a needle. Bipolar is the creation of millions of both positive and negative ions. And the reason the word bipolar is so important is because there are ionization technologies that only produce negative ions. So the technology we're discussing is the creation of both positive and negative. And for the rest of these slides, you'll see the acronym NBPI because needlepoint bipolar ionization is a lot of letters. Next group of slides, we're going to make the case for why needlepoint bipolar ionization is important. And if you've ever walked into a building and seen a sunbeam shine through a window, you can you might have seen this at home or at the office or walking through a building that you're visiting. And you see that it looks hazy in that sunbeam. That's because sunlight is bouncing off the particles that are present in the air. Pollen, dust, mold, danders, etc. And a person can even walk through that haze and you won't notice much movement of the particles. These particles are so small, they don't have much surface area, so that when a person walks through them, you don't see a lot of movement. Did you know that one cubic foot of air can have as many as 18 million particles floating around in it at any given point in time? To my mind, that's a very staggering number. According to ASHRAE, a cubic foot of clean air can contain up to 10 million particles. Indoor particle levels are influenced by the number of occupants that are in the space, what they're doing, what kind of building materials are present. HVAC systems, as April mentioned, we've got ventilation, we've got exhaust, and of course we've got our conditioned air. So we've included a table here that just gives us some basic examples of how particles are generated and how many are generated with some basic activities. The simple act of sitting or standing still, we can create 100,000 particles just breathing and sitting relatively still. The action of standing up or sitting down can create two and a half million particles. Walking, 10 million. Playing with the kids or the dog, 30 million. Sweeping the floors or in businesses that are actually manufacturing a product, grinding, welding, can create more than a billion particles in one cubic foot of air. So airborne particles have, they've been studied for decades and you can find lots of literature, whether it's ASHRAE, the filtration industry, the medical industry. There's a lot of information out there. The difference is the public awareness of it has increased significantly with COVID-19. And here is an image that you may have even seen published by any of a number of agencies to help try to illustrate how particles move in the air. Um, in this diagram, the woman on the left is simply talking to the woman on the right. And it just shows us how large particles will drop quickly. The smaller the particle is, the longer it travels. But very, very small nuclei can travel anywhere from five to even more than 160 feet in the air. So airborne particles act as a transport mechanism 
for bacteria. Let's look at this in a little more detail. When it comes to airborne particles, this is a situation where size really does matter. But the smaller the size of the particle, the more potentially dangerous it can be. The, the illustration here of a human respiratory system is going to help us walk through this. Um, particulate matter is measured in microns, and a micron is one one millionth of a meter. This is an ISO standard that was put together for the filtration industry, and the particulate matter ratings are the different ratings that you will find on filters. Larger particles will get caught in our nose and throat. That's what our PM10 is showing here. The smaller the particle we get down to one micron, the more dangerous it is. A study was just released at the end of May that indicates that the very fine particles can get to the very deep areas of our lungs, and this is where the most damage is occurring. Kind of to help us visualize what micron sizes are. A pollen spore can run anywhere between 10 and 100 microns in size. Bacteria is greater than 0.1 under 10 microns. Viruses can be incredibly small. To give us a few more points of reference, a very fine grain of sand is 90 microns. A human hair is 50 to 70. And there's a lot of published inf information that says somewhere around the 3 to 2.5 uh, micron, the particles get too small to be seen by the human eye. In case you're curious, the coronavirus comes in somewhere around 0.12 microns in size. Summarizing airborne particles. Particles act as a transport mechanism for virus and bacteria. The smaller the particle, the further it can travel in the air. And the smaller it is, the more harmful it can be. So let's connect the dots to needlepoint bipolar ionization, and then we're going to talk about that and how we can use it. Whether ions exist in nature, or they're artificially created, ions are nature's air scrubbers. And um, before we take, jump into the next slide, April mentioned as part of the Harvard studies that one of the recommendations that is being made is increase the filter efficiency in your HVAC systems to pick up more particulate matter. That works great in some systems, but some HVAC systems are not designed so that they can handle a filter with a greater pressure drop across it. So let's talk about how needlepoint bipolar ionization works. We want to create that beach or mountain environment by artificially raising the levels of ions in the space. So we create ions, we release them into the space, and we do it via the conventional heating and cooling system. The ions attach to bacteria, viruses, mold spores, VOCs, and other particles, pathogens, and gases. Let's dive for a minute into um, one of the pathogens, and this is a virus. On the right-hand side, we see a virus in the center of the the uh, rings. On the left hand side, we're creating ions and adding them to the airstream. The positive and negative ions form hydroxyls. What happens is these hydroxyls will destroy the virus by damaging the cell wall of the virus and the inner cell material. Uh, for bacteria, they rob the bacteria of the hydrogen as well, and hydrogen is a food source that they need for survival. The byproduct of this is harmless water vapor. Airborne particles can also be addressed with needlepoint bipolar ionization. 
the ions will attach to these small particles in the air, the ones that we can't see. Once they attach, they start attracting other particles of opposite polarity, and it makes them grow larger in size. We refer to this as agglomeration. Think of it like taking individual snowflakes and packing them together to make a snowball. Particles that were previously too small to be captured in a filter are now larger like our snowball. Now that they're larger, they can actually be captured in the filter. Typically, those small particles previously bypass the filter. They land on the coil and they can grow into a biofilm. By agglomerating them and making them builder, bigger, <laughs> we can actually pick them up in the filter and we're making the filter more effective and efficient. So by reducing airborne particles, by using, using agglomeration, we will reduce airborne particles and we can reduce the transmission of viruses and pathogens in the air. Let's take a couple minutes and show you some real life test results. Here we see two plastic containers sealed and they contain the same thing. Each contains a flesh, fresh slice of bread and a cup of water. On the left hand side, we have a unit equipped with needlepoint bipolar ionization. On the right, there's nothing. After 12 days, you can see that the bread on the right-hand side is completely covered in mold. The bread on the left-hand side has remained fresh. There's no mold growth on it. You may see on the side of the container a little condensation. That's the water vapor byproduct. The beauty of it is it might be cre uh, creating water vapor inside that container, but it is not allowing the mold to grow on that slice of bread. Because I'm visual, I threw another one in. Here's a coil um, from a hospital in North Carolina. As you can see, this coil is covered in biofilm. And I'm going to digress for a minute. Sometimes when we clean a coil with steam or chemicals, we can make the surface of the coil look great. It looks nice and shiny. Unfortunately, what can happen is sometimes the dirt gets pushed further into the coil. And that's really true if we have coils that's four, five, six rows deep. It's not uncommon to see that happen. While the surface of that coil looks clean, a measure of the pressure drop across the entire depth of that coil will tell a different story. But three weeks later on this very same coil, this is a photo. Uh, it wasn't just the surface of this coil that was clean. Uh, pressure transducers actually showed the pressure drop through the depth of the coil to be near the originally original factory specs. So needlepoint bipolar ionization technology, if it's installed at the coil, it can clean the length and the depth of the coil. In addition, it's dumping ions into the space to combat whatever is present, whether it's bacteria, viruses, pathogens, mold spores, etc. One final comment about test results. Um, as I indicated, there are lots of manufacturers that use a lot of different types of technology to create ionization. If you're looking at it, just ask them for their efficacy test results to show you how fast they are able to manage, handle, kill, uh, different types of pathogens. Okay. We've identified a few benefits of needlepoint bipolar ionization. When we look at the air in the breathing zone, the equipment can offer peace of mind to occupants and visitors because it can reduce and control viruses. It can reduce and control bacteria and it can reduce and control airborne particles. In addition, uh, needlepoint bipolar ionization also assists with mold and VOCs. How can we use it for energy efficiency? As was covered in the beginning of the presentation, 
um, April mentioned it, good ventilation is important. And ASHRAE standard 62 defines how the amount of outside air for any given space based on people and occupancy is determined. In the standard, there are different procedures that are allowed to be used. The ventilation rate procedure is the one that we see used most commonly by design firms. What's starting to pick up in momentum and popularity is the indoor air quality procedure. This is performance-based and uh, it has to take a look at and analyze contaminant sources, concentration limits, how many people are in the space, what their level of activity is, and from all of that, it can potentially offer a lower outside air requirement. The key is we have to control the indoor contaminants and then we can reduce how much outside air we can introduce into the building. To do this, there is a calculated approach and it is very specifically spelled out in the ASHRAE standard how that is done and that is the process that is used. So let's talk about a couple of examples of where this has been done to show some energy savings. This is a large arena down in Tampa and the renovation challenge was to improve energy efficiency, reduce outside air because we had moisture issues due to a very humid climate, all while maintaining occupant comfort. The needlepoint bipolar ionization equipment part of the project cost was $350,000. This was part of a larger project. There's chiller replacement, controls upgrade, a lot of other things that occurred. The needlepoint bipolar ionization component of it was $350,000. Because the outside air was able to be reduced, we, there were reductions in chiller size, chiller pumps, chiller motors, to the tune of a million dollars. Additionally, because that outside air wasn't having to be cooled, dehumidified, and in rare instances heated in the winter, there's an energy savings associated with that, and it was $115,000 a year. So the needlepoint bipolar ionization return on the investment is immediate. The beauty of it was bundled with the entire package. Chillers are expensive, pumps, motors, doing this kind of a retrofit is very expensive. It helps bring the overall payback of a project down. Uh, a tour of that arena was taken five years later, and this is a photograph of the coils with needlepoint bipolar ionization installed on them. They looked brand new. Let's look at a jump park. Uh, the customer, the client, was purchasing an existing vacant building, previously had a different occupancy, so it was a conversion of the space to the trampoline park. The mechanical engineering firm came back to the client and shared with them, in order to meet the IEQ standards, an additional 55 tons of HVAC equipment needed to be added. The Needlepoint bipolar equipment cost for this project was $50,000. The HVAC equipment savings was $63,000 because that additional 55 tons did not have to be purchased and installed. There was also a small utility rebate associated with it and energy savings by not having to run those 55 tons of heating and cooling equipment. So, Again, if we just look at the return on investment for the needlepoint bipolar equipment, it's less than a month. If you bundle it all together, it improves your return on investment for the entire project overall. Uh, we'll talk for a minute about uh, K-12 retrofit. Darlene has been working with the school district to have needlepoint bipolar ionization installed throughout the district. And for each school, it's analyzed how much outdoor air reduction is available. 
if it's a renovation and equipment can be downsized, that's great. That's a, a savings in equipment. But that's not always the case. Sometimes we're just going and retrofitting. So then it's just reducing outside air dampers, reducing the amount of air that's brought in, and we get energy savings by not having to heat and cool that air. The local utilities offer rebates on that, and it's been working beautifully throughout the school system. The thing that's really interesting about this particular project that we wanted to share with you is there was a different benefit that no one had planned for. There were two identical K-12 school footprints, identical footprint-wise and number of students, number of teachers. The week of January 10th, 2020 of this year, the school that had the needlepoint bipolar ionization equipment installed had reported three absences of students for the entire week. The school that had not been retrofitted yet reported 80 absences for the same week. And what they shared with us was less sick days equals more government funding. More students in seats is more funding for the school. We had an airport renovation where they asked to, for assistance mitigating airplane exhaust fumes, helping to decrease operating costs while improving energy efficiency. They had some small spots of mold issues, all while maintaining occupant comfort while a renovation was underway. The equipment cost for this project was $70,000. The utility, the outdoor air reduction was pretty significant, so the utility came back with a very nice rebate of $15,500. There was an annual energy savings for downsizing equipment and not having to bring that much outside air into our space, $35,000. And the return on investment, again, for the needlepoint bipolar ionization equipment was less than two months. I think I have one or two more of these and then, um, We'll talk, we'll wrap this up. Medical office building, this one was interesting, had mold presence throughout the facility. Remediation costs were estimated to be $100,000 to clean and seal the ductwork. And we're not talking about a situation where April showed us, where we had big gaping holes, where um, return exhaust really does need to be sure that it's sealed so that we're not leaking bad air and, and training it and picking it up into our supply airstream. Um, basically, they had to empty this office building. The clients had to work remote while the problems were addressed. The summary for this, there was a noticeable improvement after the first week of operation of the needlepoint bipolar ionization equipment. Five months later, post-testing showed the mold was eliminated. The outside air that was introduced in the building was reduced, and there was a small energy savings that resulted from that of $12,500. So where does this bring us? We saw this slide earlier. Um, and I, before I review this slide, I do want to make a comment. Not every building is going to be a candidate for reduction of outside air. There are lots of technologies that are available. Needlepoint bipolar ionization is a marvelous technology and it can offer interesting solutions. As we reviewed earlier, we saw that when we're talking about in the breathing zone, this equipment can offer peace of mind to control viruses and bacteria and particles and mold and VOCs. From a building owner or operator perspective, there are also some benefits for consideration. And as we've shown, there's a decrease in outside air that can produce energy savings. We haven't talked about the fact that having and maintaining a clean coil also provides energy savings. There's a pressure drop across the coil. The fan off can be used. You can calculate how much energy is used, especially the um, the more the pressure builds up, the more the dirt builds up, the more the pressure builds up, the bigger the pressure drop across the coal, the more energy that's used. Keep the coals clean, you save money. And wouldn't it be nice to have your O&M team or the contractor that performs the maintenance 
spend less time cleaning your coils and actually looking at diagnosing and keeping the equipment up and running at its finest and less time spent cleaning coils. As we've shown, there's an opportunity if you're in a replacement environment or a new construction environment and it's the right type of building, HVAC equipment can be downsized. New construction or replacement market. So as we reach the end here, I'm going to turn it over to Heidi and um, to you guys for Q&A for April and for the needlepoint bipolar ionization technology as well. Okay, I will um, read the questions here. Um, are there any examples of MPP, MBPI use in agricultural operations? indoor or greenhouses? Yes, they are. Uh, there are, and I'm going to actually ask if Darlene is on the line and let Darlene talk about a little of this that we've seen in... Oh, she probably... Well, I, I don't, well yeah, she's I'm, logged in. She might be able to talk. Sorry. <laughs> oh, great, I'm great, great. Thanks. Darlene, talk about cannabis and other things. Oh, okay, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, so great question. Um, yes, we have used it in cannabis facilities. Um, we can help with the powdery mold uh, or the powdery mildew on the plants and the mold and also the smell in the cannabis facility as well. So the answer is yes, we definitely have done that. We've also used it in like turkey farm, turkey barns. Um, we had a 600,000 square foot turkey barn where we designed a specialized system to basically rain ions down on the birds and it removed the ammonia smell uh, and also help the birds feel better. So we've definitely used it in agriculture and farming and things like that. So great question. Okay, um, another one for Tracy or Darlene. Can NPBI be easily installed on packaged rooftop units? Oh, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Go ahead, Trace. It's that simple. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, does NBPI actually remove viruses from the space from occupants, occupants before the air reaches the return air path? Go ahead, Dar. Yeah. Yeah, so um, when the needle point bipolar, when, when it's building, <clears throat> when it's building positive and negative ions in the space coming through, you know, your ductwork and everything coming in, the ions start immediately attacking uh, things that are in your spaces because an ion doesn't want to be an ion. It wants to attach to something. So whether that's an airborne virus, a surface virus, an airborne particle, a mold spore, it wants to attach to something. Um, and as I've said to many people that I've had discussions with, our technology is not the end-all be-all, but it is being proactive and doing something for your spaces. And we have, uh, our technology has been proven to kill COVID-19, so, and we have test results to prove that. So we certainly do believe that needlepoint bipolar ionization is a great technology to mitigate viruses and help with um, bacteria, pathogens, germs, indoor air quality issues overall. It, and I'll uh, follow on to Darlene's feedback and say the neatest thing about this technology is that it leaves the air handler, travels through the ductwork, and it goes into the space. To Darlene's point, because it's either positively or negatively charged, it's seeking out something so that it becomes stable. And not all technologies will travel from the HVAC system through the ductwork and into the space. Okay, another question for you. Um, have any concerns about ozone generation been raised with NPBI? In some yes. cases, when it, yeah, that's true. There has been. There is competition. You know, there are different companies out there that have different technologies. Um, and ozone is a big problem, and Tracy can speak to this as well. We've 
we've had we've done a lot of studies on other equipment through you know gather data data gathering and have found that ozone is a big problem in most of those technologies our technology in particular is ul2998 listed which means it's ozone free but there are other technologies out there that um, can create positive and negative ions but they it does create ozone in doing so so Sorry, it's, a, it's a great question no 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 it's a great question and um, I had that slide that I went very quickly over that said when you're comparing different technologies, ask for the test results. Ask for your UL ratings and your CE ratings and make sure that you're working with devices that are not going to produce anything that's going to be harmful to your building occupant. Okay. Um, is NPPI complementary or competitive with ultraviolet purification system, uh, parentheses, biofighter, ultra, ultraization. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> These are new words. I'll say it's a little both. I'll say it's a little both and turn it over to Dar. <laughs> yeah. Um, UV, you know, they we do compete with UV and HEPA filters. That That's a very true statement. Um, with what UV does, it does it well. Uh, but what our what the needlepoint bipolar ionization technology does, it does it better. And the reason I say that is because we what when we travel with the airstream and air touches everything, you can impact it with the air that's touching the surface or touching the air. With UV, um, you know, it basically the light has to see whatever it is it's uh, attacking. So the whatever virus or pathogen or bacteria it has to actually be in the light before it can impact it. So with the with the technology that travels through the airstream, uh, it's much more effective than just sitting on a coil or sitting in a room stagnant. It is traveling into the spaces and starting the process of creating the positive and negative ions and attaching to the bad stuff. Okay, um, here's one for April. How large of a hole can AeroSeal's product seal? Yeah, so we typically seal up to a five eighths of an inch of a hole or a gap. So just like Ashray says, a 75% of ducts um, have 10 to 25% of leakage. Where we actually see the majority of the leaks are in the, the connections uh, where the ducts come together. Uh, so most of the time, it's, it's in those little crevices. Uh, the sealant doesn't line or coat the duct or have any remediation qualities in, in any way. It only goes to where those holes and gaps are. So um, the sealant kind of feels a little bit like, you know, when you get a credit card in the mail, uh, how that is, is goes onto the paper that comes onto. Um, that's what our sealant is. And like I said, it seals a hole up to five eighths of an inch. Um, and that holds up to about seven inches of water column. Okay, um, and the, the follow-up, well, not a follow-up, but still for April probably. <laughs> um, would your project, product react negatively with the MPBI product? Will the ions react neg negatively with the sealant? Yeah, so the sealant is actually a vinyl acetate polymer, the same thing that works in, that's in baby's pacifiers, hairspray, things like that. And like I said, it only goes to where the holes and gaps are. It doesn't line or coat the ducts in any way. Um, so I don't believe there would be any kind of breakdown of the sealant based on um, what they're doing with their technology. But I'll pass it over to Tracy um, to you know, let her clarify that. I don't see that as being any different than um, duck seal, mastic, et cetera, um, and it doesn't interact with any of those. Darlene, do you have any experience you can add? No, not really. I really don't. Okay, um, April, are there any rules of thumb for how old a building's ductwork should be to qualify for sealing? 
Yeah, so there was a study done um, at LBNL that said even newly installed ducts uh, leak 10 to 30 percent. So this is something that we we see a lot in older buildings, and, and that's due to different code issues and things like that. But it's very common in buildings that are even less than 10 years old, and that's due to just poor construction. Um, and also uh, not a lot of testing being required in different areas of the country uh, for codes and things like that. So there's not really a rule of thumb um, based on age. Uh, for us, uh, a rule of thumb for good candidates for energy savings are large buildings. So buildings that I can't um, throw a baseball over is what I call large. So those are always good candidates for us. Um, anything that's running a lot of high static pressure, um, anything that has high outside air or high occupancy are great candidates for us. Um, and yeah, that, that pretty much is what we look for the most. There's different kinds of connections. Flange connections are, are typically a little more leaky. Um, but yeah, we, we like to look at all projects and um, you know give you our best estimate on how that all works. Um, for Tracy and Darlene, are you publishing results or working with ASHRAE to educate performance of MPBI? And also, is there a copy of the test results that prove BPI can kill COVID-19? Those are two separate questions. I know Darlene can speak very passionately. Um, the inventor of the product sits on the technical committee for ASHRAE. There are a lot of conversations going on quite regularly about needlepoint bipolar ionization. Um, as a matter of fact, yeah. even as late as last week. So go ahead, Darlene, take it from there. That's okay. I, I really just think that um, if we could get more people inside ASHRAE to listen, it would it would be a lot smoother. Um, and as far as test results of COVID-19 test kit or killing, yes, we definitely have um, the test results to prove it. Um, we we um, mimic the inside of an airplane when this was uh, this test was done, based on it's going in certain aircraft uh, that I cannot mention, but. That's why we were pushed to the front of the line with the COVID-19 testing. So, yes, we can provide that. Okay, um, we have just a couple of more. Um, in terms of increased energy usage from MPVI, is there heat generated from using it, thereby increasing cooling load and or significant amount of energy use from being from using the technology itself? No, the thing, no. <laughs> the thing that's so cool about this is the energy consumption is amazingly low. Um, for the largest piece of equipment that we have, the consumption is 15 watts of energy when it's operating. And when I say largest, that's across a 240 inch built up air hammer coil. Okay, and then one final question. Uh, for Tracy, which section of the HVAC system does your system get installed? The MPPI. I apologize for that. You heard my dog in the background. <laughs> uh, the the needlepoint bipolar ionization can be installed in a couple of different places. Uh, we really like putting it on the coil of the air handler because, again, you get that cleaning across the coil and through the depth of the coil in addition to putting ions out in the space. Um, but there are duct-mounted applications as well. Um, we've mounted them on blowers on the other side of the coil. Um, there are several opportunities for mounting. Um, I think I might have not answered the question on pressure drop, and the pressure drop is negligible for this equipment. Um, that is one place where this compared to UV, there is a difference, um, because the UV light in the airstream does create more pressure drop than the needlepoint bipolar ionization does. Um, 
And actually, I want to hop back for a minute. When somebody asked about um, whether or not this would impact the air seal, uh, probably should mention that if you're air sealing the duct system, you want it to be, you want the HVAC system off, I'm assuming. Um, we'll let April jump in. I would recommend that it would be off so that we don't push ions while you're trying to seal the duct system, or at least turn the ion generation off while you're sealing the duct work. Yeah, and we we always have the system off and pressurize the duct ourselves while we're doing the air seal. So, good point. Yeah, but you two, one of the questions we got was whether or not your two products have been used together yet that you know of. Not that I'm aware of. Darlene, are you? No. Okay. But it would be a good match. <laughs> Well, that's that's the Too idea, hot. right? <laughs> okay, well, it is three and we've hit our hour and I think we answered everyone's questions, but if not, um, I will be sharing the recording and the presentation slides with everyone who registered. So emails for our presenters are on there. And thank you very much, April and Tracy and Darlene for presenting today. And I hope to hear or see all of you on our webinar next week. Thank you. Heidi, thank you.